Sheikh was talking about the fact that I used to be in business. I like to do the inventory before I get into something too far. And so I'm going to ask, how many Muslims do we have with us today? Okay. Let me go the other way. How many non-Muslims we have with us? How do you like being surrounded by all these terrorists? Ah, oh, Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, as we go through the program, it really helps if you laugh at the jokes because they won't get any better. <laughs> the title of the program we're talking about is living the example of a Muslim or living the example of what Islam tells us to be. And that's a very big statement even before you get started for a couple of reasons. Not the least of which is that Islam claims to present an offer for every human being regardless of where they are or when they are, but for everybody everywhere every time offering them the correct way of life. In the Lagut Arabiya, in the Arabic language, this is called Deen. Deen means a way of life. This is the word that's referred to throughout the Quran. It starts early on in the Quran and it goes all the way to the back and it's constantly being used over and over and over. However, when it's translated to the English language, it is usually transferred as the word religion which often makes people confused and not really understand what the bigger message of Islam is about. I would like to give you some examples of that without really losing focus on the subject that we're going to be talking about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, tells us in the Quran, in the dina in the lahil Islam, and the translation usually says, verily with God, the religion is Islam. But I maintain that if you're going to translate some of the words, you should translate all of them. And you should make an effort to really get it out, even if it takes a phrase or two, because people are, I think, more interested in knowing the meaning of the words of the Quran or the intent behind it than they are just looking for a word-by-word -word, uh, translation. And in this particular case, it's a very important verse. It's in chapter 3, verse 19, and it actually gives a, a much bigger meaning when you understand. It said, Verily with the law, the way of life huh, is submission to Him in obedience and peace. Now, this is a lot different than just saying that. Uh, the religion is Islam because otherwise you will think, oh, because all of us know that the religion called Islam as a noun, it comes at the time of Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 1400 years ago. That verse would seem to imply that everybody that before his time is going to hell or something or they don't have the right religion, if you said it according to the first uh, version I gave of it. In this same chapter, chapter 3, Surah Al Imran, verse 85, you find another statement, which again, if it's not correctly presented, you're going to wind up with a strange meaning. And that's when Allah says, And in this case, this is verse number 85. In this case, they translate it. Whoever wants a religion other than Islam, Allah won't accept it. In the next life, they're going to be with the losers, meaning in hellfire. 
Well, wow. Now, again, this seems to go back to that same thing. And you're saying to me that, okay, if I don't go with what you're saying, I'm going to hell. And, and all the people before that, they're going to hell. What if somebody lives on a desert island and they never got exposed to the word? And, you know, that's a very complex thing all of a sudden to make a statement like that. But again, if you go back and break it down, as I just said, that, that using a phrase and translating Islam properly in this instance, you're going to find it comes out, makes sense. It said, whoever wants to have a way of life hmm, other than the one that Allah is prescribing for them, He's not going to accept that. And in the hereafter, they'll be with the losers. Well, does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. I had a problem the first time I read the Quran with some of these verses because I, I thought that, well, I agree with so much of the Quran, at the same time, some of these things sound, you know, just very harsh and, and even sound, uh, well, tough really tough. How could a person uh, read this and, and come away with a, a better understanding? So after two or three different translations, then I started learning the Arabic language. And then you see, ah, it's a much, it's a much bigger picture out here. In fact, you don't even have a small part of the picture when you're dealing with the English. This word is used Again, as I mentioned, all the way throughout the Quran, but I want to take you back to a couple of other places in the, in the Quran. Now I want to go back to almost the end of the Quran when it tells us how to deal with a person who is a disbeliever, someone who has come to you and is basically offered uh, that why don't you compromise your religion? You have beliefs, you have values, you have things that you believe in, your moral standards. This is what you're about. And somebody's asking you now, why don't you compromise all of that and hang out with us and do the things we do for a period of time and then maybe we'll come over to your way and do what you do. What would you tell them? Huh? You, you, you have morals, you have standards, you have things that you value, but somebody's telling you, throw all that away and come hang out with us and we're going to bibbidi bop and do X, Y, Z and all the rest of it. I'm not going to give you any ideas. There's plenty of that going around. But something that you're morally and, and uh, spiritually opposed to, what would you tell them? Well, this was the offer given to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. And before he can open his mouth, Allah gave revelation to him and he gave the answer, and it's a part of the Quran. Whenever you hear the word cool, it means say. It's an order from Allah for the prophet to say something. The same way it was in the book of Ezekiel. I'm sure you're familiar with the Bible. And it's in many chapters of Ezekiel, it starts out by saying, Say, O son of man. It's exactly the same idea here. And it's Allah telling him, Say this to the people. Say, Kul ya ayuhal kafirun. لا أبود ما تابدون ولا أنتم أبدون ما أبود ولا أنتم أبدون ما أبود لكم دينكم واليدين. Now, did you hear the word "dean" in there? Dinakum, which means your dean. Okay. More or less, the meaning here it says for him to tell these people, say, "O oh, you who are the disbelievers, you who reject faith." I'm not going to worship what you worship. And you're not going to worship what I worship. I'll never worship what you worship. And you're not going to worship what I worship. To me, my way of life, and to you, your way. Now, does that make sense? Unfortunately, the translators put it, most of them put it down in a term where it just sounds really flat. It doesn't give you this depth. But for sure, you see here, even the word dean is being used to represent people's way of life. Your way of life, my way of life. To you, your religion is how they translate it. To me, my religion, but it's more, it's my way of life. Because if you're saying it to people, for instance, an atheist, what religion do atheists have? But you're saying it to atheists, right? 
Atheists come to you and say, why don't you just give up belief and just do whatever you want to do and be amoral for a year. That's why I think they offered him a year. And then, we may, you know, then we'll, for a year we'll come over there and worship with you. And you're like, what? <laughs> so this, I think, helps you to understand this word dean. It's very critical to understand this word dean. And then finally, before I leave the subject, there's one more very key place. Because we live in a land full of Christians and Jews, and they, like us, have this monotheistic attitude. We believe there's really only one God. We're not out here like some religions worshiping rats and snakes and cows and everything else. We believe that there is a God, and he's not a human being. He's not walking around on the earth. He's God, and he's up in the heavens. This is the belief of the Muslims, okay? So, with that in mind, we'd like to mention a verse here that refers the Muslims to look back, to look back at the Christians and look back at the Jews and see what were they ordered. And Allah said that they weren't divided up into their old schisms until this clear proof came unto them. And then it says, You heard the word deen, I'm, that's, you can hear me focusing on that. And they were not ordered, uh, actually commanded. Uh, the, the word Amr here is talking about commandment. The commandments. So the people the, of the book or the followers of the Bible were not ordered or commanded any more than this. To worship God alone without any partners. No gods beside God. And keep the way of the deen pure for him. Establish Regular worship, salah, we call it salah, where you stand and bow, and that's called salah. And pay the zakah, zakah, it means purification, to purify, you can purify things, but in this case it's talking about purifying your money, or holding your wealth by giving money to the charity, giving to the poor people. And it says, and this is the way of life most clear. Now, understanding I use deen in all these cases, can you come up with a better word? And it's certainly not just going to be satisfied by saying religion. Unless you want to retranslate the word religion in English. And I don't think that's necessary. So having laid that out for you, and now, uh, of course, I'm talking about deen. I want to mention that you're watching the Dean Show. That's the name of the show that will be on here in Chicago area, channel 36, a uh, real late night Thursday night, if your mom will let you stay up, it's uh, like 11 o'clock at night, Friday, I thought you said Thursday, it's Friday night, oh, you can stay up an hour later on Friday night, right, no problem, okay, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> hmm, and you're also watching the Bridge to Faith. We've got two programs going here at the same time. Bridge to Faith, and that, the idea behind that show, and we broadcast that on cable access. Uh, ours is channel, ugh, I don't know my own channel, 30. I think we're channel 30 and channel 10 in uh, the Washington, D.C. area and Northern Virginia. And that program is dedicated to presenting the idea of faith in general to show that it's necessary for a human being to have faith in something. Otherwise, they live a miserable and sad life. And then often they wind up taking their own lives. This is a very sad condition. And then we usually have something in that program dealing with the subject of learning the Arabic language using the English that you already know. It's called Arabic in English, has a website for that. And then usually we end our program talking about somebody's particular bridge to faith. Now I got all the commercials out of the way. I'm ready to get started on the program. Talking about the deen, its effect on us, and how we can live it as Muslims. The example of a Muslim is contained in the word itself. Muslim. Muslim comes from a word in Arabic. So you have to understand it from that standpoint. Otherwise, you may miss a, a good part of the meaning here. Muslim is nothing more than the noun, one who is performing a verb. The one who is performing the verb. What's the verb? It comes from the same root as the word Islam. 
Islam is the noun, represents, you'll say the religion, but I'm going to show you something and let you think about it. It comes from Aslama. Aslama comes from Seen, Lam, Meme. Three letters. And when it reaches this state of Islam, it carries the meaning of five things in English. Five things. You can't say this word in English. That's why they don't translate it. They leave it. Surrender. Have you heard the song Sweet Surrender? This is where it's coming from. This is the meaning. Surrender. Submission. Obedience. Sincerity. And peace. Now, have you ever heard Muslims say, Islam is peace. You heard the, Islam is peace. Islam is peace. Well, that's where they got it from, from that part of it. But it really doesn't mean peace. I'll prove it to you. When I sat down here and introduced the topic, I said some things in Arabic. Did you hear me say, Salam Alaikum? Huh? Did I mispronounce it? No. I said, Salam. I didn't say, Islam Alaikum, did I? No, it's not Islam Alaikum. It's Salam Alaikum. They're related. Definitely. It's also related to the Hebrew language. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but Hebrew... Aramaic and Arabic are all from the same Semite tribe, Semitic languages. That's why Shalom Aleikum and Salam Aleikum sound so much alike. It happened to me when I was up in uh, New York. I was up in Brooklyn and I saw a friend of mine and I hollered out at him and I, I jumped out of the van that I was in. I, I was so excited to see my friend, you know, I ran over to him and I shouted at him, Salam Aleikum. And he said, Waikum Salam. I went over, I was shaking his hand. Now, a man walked up to us, and he didn't really speak much English, okay? But he was wearing a long black coat, and he had a black hat on, and he had his hair, it was like black curls coming like this, and a beard, you know? And he looked at us, and he said, You're Hebrew, Yahud. Yahud? I said, no, no, no. He said, you said, Shalom Aleichem. I said, no, we said, Salam Alaikum. And, and he was going, oh, and he was shaking my hand. I said, yes, we're Muslim. And he went, oh. <laughs> he probably thought he lost wudu or something. <laughs> you can cut that part out. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> so, you, you understand this word, Islam has a big meaning and you can see that when you have a verb that's structured like this it has to have and requires two entities in order to be performed this is the type of verb that requires two entities walk doesn't require that talk run jump up and down all these things can all be done by one but when you talk about this submission surrender obedience sincerity and the piece that you could do by yourself, but the others you can't. You can't. It needs two entities. One is the greater, one is the lesser. One is the master, one is the servant. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the word Islam. That's best understood as the one who has given orders, and now the other one is going to surrender, submit to the terms, going to obey these orders, they're going to do this sincerely, even if nobody's looking, even if nobody knows, they will do it, and they will do it in peace. So it's a, it carries a big meaning. Independently, you could do one and not necessarily do the others, but it requires, if you're going to be in Islam, to do all of this at the same time. And if you do... You're not an Islam er because Arabic doesn't use suffix. It uses a prefix. The prefix is the letter mim. It's pronounced mu. So when you travel, the word for Arabic traveling is safar. Our word safari comes from this very same word. So a traveler is called a mu safar. And when you do the worship called sali, you are musali, plural, musaliin. And if you are... Uh, calling the prayer, that, that is called uh, adhan, the person becomes a mu'adhan. If you, uh, you, you get the idea, if you surrender and submit to God on his terms in peace, then you're a what? A mu'islam. Muslim. It's as simple as that. Now, that means 
essentially the word, just by the word itself, if a person believes in God and they're trying to do what he wants them to do, they're doing so in peace, then they're a what? They're a Muslim. But watch what happens. After I entered into Islam, I'll go back to the folks that I used to preach to down in, in the valley of Texas. And when I went down there, uh, by then I had grown some beard and I was wearing one of, these, one of those white ones. You see those white outfits they have, you know? And that's what I had on. And I get down there and the lady that knew me, she's very elderly, you know, and she knew me well and she looked and she said, Child, what's the matter with you? So what do you mean? She said, well, you're growing a beard and you're wearing a dress. <laughs> you get a good point. I said, I became a Muslim. She said, what? I said, I became a Muslim. She said, you can't do that. I said, why? She said, you're not from over there. I said, from over where? I knew what she was meaning when I said, I said, from where? She said, well, wherever they come from. So I d tried, endeavored to give her the same insight that I gave you just now by using the word and showing her that, you know, whoever is doing what God wants them to do, this in, in English, okay, in Arabic, then that would be a Muslim. She's like, what? I said, okay, let's go real slow. You believe in God? She said, you know I do. And he's one? She said, of course. And he hadn't any partners? She said, what are you trying to preach now? I said, I'm just asking you. Yes, of course. And I said, do you want to do what God wants you to do? She said, all my life. She said, the Bible says it. Huh? When you said God's will be done on earth, you mean it? Then you try to live up to it. I said, all right. I said, so if you believe in God and you're trying to do what he wants you to do in Arabic, that would be Islam. She said, oh, and one doing it would be a Muslim. She said, oh, okay. I said, so see, you could be a Muslim. She said, no, I can't. <laughs> I said, why? She said, I'm not from over there. <laughs> so you see, as, <laughs> as much as you want to talk, some people aren't going to get it because the plane's going to fly low, but it's going to still go over their head. <laughs> we understand, of course, that uh, there is a lot of resistance uh, to the notion of Islam and Muslims in the world today, and that's in part to the media hype. Media, they have to run with a story. You can't just say that a little boy helped an old lady across the street and did a good deed today. You have to carry it to a higher level, otherwise it won't make the front page. You've got to put something in there, you know, elderly woman captured by, you know, uh, a boy and drug across the, uh, okay, that sounds much better than a Boy Scout trying to do a good deed. You've got to put something in there to get some hype. And especially if you've got a story already pretty decent, we just add a little bit more, leave a few things out, and you've got a headline. So we'll blame at least a portion of it on the media, but at the same time, I'll tell you, that's not the only story. We have some governments involved that have some bigger issues. We have big business involved, and they've got some big issues and big bucks behind some of this stuff. But even then, if we laying all the blame that we want, we have to come back and look at the Muslims themselves. And you have some Muslims who don't do Islam. There are Muslims who are not doing what I just said. They don't necessarily surrender, submit in peace to God's will. Right? So that's a bad image. But where is it coming from? Well, it's not coming from Islam. It's coming from a human being. Now, question. Do human beings make mistakes? I'll remind you. Fool me once, and I voted for the guy. There's a man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you got that one right. All right. We have a good thing in this country, by the way. A guy can only run twice. And one, that's it. Once he's, well, he can only be in twice. He can run all he wants. Some of them ought to run faster, I think. I need to come back to our story here. We're talking about what it is to be a Muslim. Now you've understood it from uh, the standpoint of the breakdown of the word, the etymology here of the word. Let us look at what is the character of a Muslim. If you would like to know the character of a Muslim, 
I think it's best to quote what the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said. Now, you gentlemen, how many of you are married? Raise your hand if you're married. Now, raise your hand if you're only married to one. <laughs> I, <guess. laughs> I couldn't resist that. <laughs> A couple of ladies over there going, uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Just kidding. What I'm trying to do now, you see, is kind of set it in your mind to understand that a woman knows a man really well if she's married to him. Is that right? She knows things about you that nobody else knows. And you wish she would never tell them. Right? The ladies, is that right? Is it, ladies are smart, by the way. They don't do that. They don't tell us. But we're all the time telling them. Is that right? That's how it works, isn't it? Yeah. Well, for sure, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was no exception here that his wife knew him very well. And here's what she said about him. If you would like to see the Quran walking, look to Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he was the example, the living example of what the Quran is teaching us. And what did, what did he do and how did he live? Many non-Muslims, well known and uh, highly praised uh, throughout history, have read or learned about Muhammad and have been surprised and have made some very interesting comments, not the least of which George Bernard Shaw Oh, Gandhi. Gandhi says something like this in his report about reading the volumes of Muhammad that he read. He said, I know now it was not the sword that, that uh, spread Islam. He said that. I know now it was not the sword that spread Islam. But rather, he said, by reading this and understanding the character of Muhammad, he said it was the heart, to reach the hearts from his character, the character of Muhammad, his good way with the people, the sensitivity and at the same time the responsibility. He gave a very glowing report at the end of which he said that he was saddened when he reached the end of the book because he said he wished there was more that he could read about this great man. So what was it that Muhammad and I want to talk about him now because he is the example for the Muslim. The Muslim doesn't need to look to Yusuf Estes to know how to be a Muslim. And you don't need to look to any of the characters today to try to take your Islam. Rather, you can simply look to his example. And it has been recorded and more has been written about Muhammad than any other human being on the planet. And that's before 9-11, just in case you thought that was afterwards. No, long before that. There has never been so much written about any person as there has been about this man. Now, you might be surprised to find that out, but there are whole entire libraries dedicated to things about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his sayings, his teachings, his companions, their lives and how they were affected by him, and it goes on and on. But let us look to the early years of Muhammad, long before there was the uh, prophecies coming to him or the revelation of the Quran. He was known even as a small boy, he was known for his character. He never lied, not once. Not ever did he lie. And people knew that about him to the extent that they called him in Arabic a sadiq. It means the, essentially they were saying this guy is the very spirit of truth itself. When you look to the Bible, by the way, translated to the English language, you find a, an example there given in John 14 and John 16 talking about the comforter who will become known to you as the spirit of truth. So this, according to Muslims, we consider this to be a prophecy about Muhammad coming. And one of the things that he was known for is tying the families back together, bringing the family ties together, the kinship, and fixing that. And that's called a counselor, isn't it? And again, you look in these same texts, you find a mighty counselor will come. 
And these things surprised me, you see. I was, of course, <laughs> very much against Islam in the very beginning of this uh, because the, I was preaching Christianity. I don't need any competition here. But then I find these things and I begin to wonder. Another thing he was known for is his fairness, his, uh, the justice, the way that he dealt. A couple examples. One time when he was coming into the mosque or the area, it wasn't called the mosque then, it was just the area of the, where they have the big square building, the big black building called the Kaaba. The Qureshi tribe was rebuilding it, doing some work on it, and there was a big stone that had been there since the time of Abraham. Okay, and they wanted to put it back in there, up where it had been. But there were several tribes involved, and each one of them wanted the honor of replacing this big stone where it goes. And they were going to fight about it. They got to the point there was going to be bloodshed. Oh, we're going to do it. Oh, no. But then they realized that, you know, guys, we, we've been through this so many times, and they have wars that even went on and on and on over things even less than this. So they said the next one who walks in through the gates there, we'll let him make the decision of which tribe it is. Well, when he walked in, they were all satisfied immediately because they knew that he was fair and just, and they said, we'll get, we're going to get justice now. And, of course, each one said, well, it'll be our tribe, you know. So when he came to them and heard the dilemma, he said to them, okay, get a sheet or some cloak or something, put it down, put the rock in the middle of it. Then each member of, uh, take one member from each tribe and let them go around and pick this thing up. And so you're all lifting it at the same time and put it right up to it. And then he pushed it in for them and they were all satisfied. Now, in the days when they used to fight each other to the bloody end, all of the tribes that were going to fight would give him all their possessions because when the fighting was over, they knew they could get it back from him, but not anybody else because he was trustworthy. Now, if you add these things up, this is an amazing character. He never drank alcohol. You say, okay, so what? Because remember in those days, a lot of times you might have bad water, you might not have anything to drink, but they always had plenty of alcohol. They had it everywhere. He never drank it. He never imbibed, not even a little bit. He also never even dated. He never had a girlfriend. He didn't run around and do what they commonly practiced. It was a very common practice in those days amongst the ignorant Arabs in that particular area. He also never worshipped those idols, the false gods and statues that were all around the area. They say there were 360 of them all scattered around in the area of worship. And different tribes from around, and, and different nations used to come from all over uh, the Arabian Peninsula to perform their various rites and do different things there at this place of worship. And they brought their own gods when they came many times. And yet all of this, he wouldn't worship any of their false gods. This gives you a little idea about his character. Now, let's talk about his personality. His personality was a quiet person, a gentle person, and one who really wasn't given to, give, you know, jumping out here, acting foolish, and, and uh, joking around, being silly, and all those things. He was very quiet, shy, humble, and everybody liked him. He was somebody you could go talk to. You could say anything to him and know that he wouldn't repeat it to other people. Let me give you an example of something, what happened. After Islam came and he was now preaching, he was rejected immediately by all of these people who were worshiping these false gods. Besides, I didn't mention this, but I don't know if you know this, in the religion business, in those days, people made a lot of money off of what other people were worshiping. People actually could go out here and trick these poor people into believing this, that, or the other and take their money away from them. You know, it was a big business. Of course, now people wouldn't do anything like that. <laughs> Would they? So, of course, they were upset with him and they didn't like what he was saying because he was saying that, you know, the money, if you're going to donate any money, it should be given straight to the poor people themselves. Oh, have you ever heard such blasphemy in your life? The poor person don't know what to do with money. Give it to me. I'll take care of it for them. You know, kind of like the government does. <laughs> 
So this explains, at least partially, why the people resisted it right away. So with this going on, the, these tribes would establish people around the area in the mountains in different places so that if anybody came there, it was traveling through there, they want to come there, then because it was a trade route, they would tell them, they would post somebody there, hey, when you get in there, watch out for this guy. He's dangerous. He is, the, uh, 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 and say whatever they wanted to say about him. And they would lie, you know. They were giving out false message about our Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa Not unlike we see today. Same thing. So here's a lady. She had come in and to town and she had a big package of some kind. And she needed somebody to carry it. She thought Muhammad Sallallahu was a porter. And she asked him to carry it. So he carried it. He didn't say, ma'am, that's not my job. He grabbed it and he carried it and he carried it and went out wherever she needed to go. And she got up there and he put it down and she said, I can't pay you. <laughs> well, he didn't do it for money anyway. She said, I can't pay you. She said, but I'll give you a tip. She said, there's a man in the city... He's claiming to be a prophet, talking about a god that he has to worship or something. And, and be, be careful of this man. And his name is Muhammad. He said, ma'am, I am Muhammad. She said, I bear witness that that's the real god to worship and you're his prophet. And on the spot. This is the story we have. It, it shows us the character of the person. And if the Muslims today would study more about Muhammad, the prophet, and less about Muhammad the soccer player, I think we'd all be a lot better off. We have a lot of characters out here today, and I mean it in the literal sense, who claim to be representing Islam. But if we look to the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the, the real life situations that he lived through, we will find here a good example for all of us. Allah says about him in the Quran a very beautiful statement. Allah said that he is the Rahmah to the Alameen. He is the very mercy to the human beings in jinn, to the worlds. Mercy to the worlds. He was a prophet and he prophesied things that came to pass. He was a messenger and he delivered a message from Almighty God. He was a father. He had children. None of his sons survived. They were all little boys when they died. But he was a good father. His children loved him very, very much. And he was a husband. His wife loved him so much, respected him so much. I want you to think about this. When he passed away, he passed away with his head in her lap. He passed away and he had his head in her lap. And look at this. She was still a young lady. She never remarried. She never got any boyfriends. She didn't go out running around. She lived to be well up into her 60s, 70s like this. And all the time... She only said the very best things about her husband. Now, I'm going to ask you, today, even living right in front of you, we have some of our women are not quite that good or respectful. You know what I'm saying? Trying to water that down a little bit. So I'm outnumbered over here and I don't need to be attacked. <laughs> but I'm saying, can you imagine a woman who never ever said anything bad about her husband? In fact, she only said the very best. This is the example now of Muhammad. And as she said, if you wanted to see the Quran walking, look to Muhammad. I think that really outlines the, the message that I wanted to deliver tonight. And I thought it would be a good thing for me to do to, to pull up right about here and give you folks a chance to speak. And how you can do that is through your questions that you send up here. So if you'll take the time, take the opportunity to go ahead and write down and then send it up to me, I'll read them out and then I'll give you the answers if I know the answers.